Hello fellow Movie Crusaders and welcome to another episode of Sean's Movie Crusades. My name is Sean Wasserkrug and today we are going to be reviewing the latest Quentin Tarantino film, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Now I personally have been super excited for this movie for the past two years ever since it was announced, mainly because of the cast and what the film was going to be about. Um, now I'm a huge Quentin Tarantino fan, I love most of his movies. Uh, Inglorious Bastards, easily one of my favorite Tarantino films, if not one of my favorite films of all time. Uh, Django Unchained, uh, Kill Bill, um, Pulp Fiction, Reservoir Dogs. I was not a huge big fan of Hateful Eight, um, but I can see the greatness in the film. It just wasn't necessarily my kind of tempo. Um, Tarantino is a phenomenal director, whether it's... Uh, his his long drawn out scenes of uh, a beautiful dialogue, uh, or his long landscaping shots, or his his touch of a very uh, hardcore violence. Tarantino usually can weave it into a very beautifully constructed story. There are times though where he gets a little full of himself and gets a little too wordy, such as hateful eight. Um, or sometimes he should have really more pulled back instead of jumping completely into his own, um, not, not facade, but his own ego, per se. Uh, so with Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, uh, I was, I was really intrigued by this, A, because of the cast. This, this, this is one of the biggest casts I've ever seen. Like, literally everyone is in this film. Um, you know, obviously the two lead, the three leads are, uh, Brad Pitt, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Margot Robbie. The other big, big thing coming out of this film is because of the trailers and where this film takes place, a lot of people are wondering is how is Quentin Tarantino going to handle the Charles Manson, Sharon Tate situation, aka the murders from 1969. So there was a lot going into this, plus there was a screenings from, uh, I can't remember if it was South, South by Southwest or if it was another festival earlier this year where they said that this movie got a 10 minute standing ovation. So there was a lot going into this film that I was super excited about, so let's go ahead and dive into the review and see what I thought about Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Uh, so the general plot of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood is it really follows kind of three separate characters, um, which is uh, Margot Robbie as Sharon Tate, uh, Leonardo DiCaprio as Rick Dalton, and Brad Pitt as Cliff Booth. Now, Rick Dalton is basically this... This um, TV show cowboy who had his own show, who was very, very popular, but then he wanted to break out into movies, and it quite didn't quite go his way, so he's kind of starting to lose the, the spotlight in his career. Now he's just kind of doing um, pilots, uh, playing the villain, you know, in most of the pilots, and, and he's just kind of, he's seeing his star fade, and he's not handling it quite well. He's actually become kind of an alcoholic because of it. But he's got his man Cliff next to him, played by Brad Pitt, who's his stunt double slash best friend. Um, but because of the stunts not being as big anymore, Cliff has kind of become more of like his assistant slash driver um, kind of situation. But it, Cliff is the ultimate best friend. He's always there for uh, for Rick, and he he never complains about anything. He's the go-to guy for everything, don't matter what Rick asks, Cliff is like, absolutely, I'll do it for you, and he's also that motivator for Rick, so whenever Rick's starting to feel down on himself, or, or feels like he's not capable of anymore, Cliff is that friend that is there to motivate him and push him to the next level, and Cliff's got some demons too, uh, that, I mean, and, and, and so he's, there's this whole character development of his character, um, that gives that added layer of, of mystery to Brad Pitt's character, then, of course, we got Margot Robbie as Sharon Tate. Uh, many people know who Sharon Tate is. She was a young, beautiful actress in the um, late 1960s who was really starting to come up uh, in, in, in show business before her, um, sadly, her timely death uh, by the hands of the Manson family. Um, and so that's it. this story kind of follows their three um, stories. Uh, they, they intertwine together. In, in ways, um, but a lot of it's just kind of a bunch of random situations, but most importantly, it's about the last few days of the golden age of Hollywood, so there's a lot of things going on in this film, um, it's kind of hard to really kind of pinpoint a plot, because there's just a lot that happens in the movie between these three characters, um, so that's, I mean, I know that's not much of a plot synopsis, 
but that's the best I can give you without going into great details or spoilers or anything like that. So that's the general plot to Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Now, what works in this film, and I mean, obviously for me, I'm a huge Quentin Tarantino fan, so there's a lot that does work in this movie for me. Most importantly are the leads. Leonardo DiCaprio does a phenomenal job as Rick Dalton. Uh, he, like I said, he's a drunk, he's, he's trying to grasp onto that spotlight that, that's starting to fade on him, he's trying to do everything he can to not let go of it and to still stay in the focus of, of being a, a star. And you see, and Leonardo DiCaprio does a phenomenal job of displaying that desperation and, and, uh, kind of almost, um, infatuation with it, and with Dalton... He's a guy who, he's tries so hard to be the best he can, but he just also can't get out of his own way in certain moments. But the moments where he kind of finally fesses up to his own shit, and uh, kind of has to look himself in the mirror, literally, and kind of put up or shut up, because th there's one particular moment, and it's in the trailer, where he um, flubs his lines. I mean, he beats himself up over it, and it's it's a beautifully done scene. And then, of course, you know, that whole section of that film, with him playing that one role in this TV show, is easily probably my favorite of the film, and it is one of the best performances of Leonardo DiCaprio that we've seen. I love his performance in this movie overall. He's a highlight in it. Even though my favorite part of the trailer, the dance that everyone knows, y'all know what I'm talking about, that dance is actually not in the movie which really, really made me sad. That scene's in the movie, but they definitely cut before he does that dance, which really made me sad. Um, so that was just forever live in infamy in a trailer or a gif. Um, but yeah, it's very sad that that dance was not in the actual film. Um, but yeah, Leonardo DiCaprio does a fantastic job, but who really stands out as the best performance overall has to go to Brad Pitt as Cliff Booth. Um, this is the best performance Brad Pitt has put on since Inglorious Bastards. Uh, I love his performance as Cliff. I love how he plays Cliff. His, he's, he, he is, while Leonardo DiCaprio plays a cowboy, Cliff is a cowboy. Cliff is that tough, rugged um, guy who's just weathered by, obviously, the, the trials of Hollywood. And he's got a lot of mystery looming over him from his past that is still haunting him to this day. But you never see him really way that that doesn't weigh him down it's just one of those things like it's the past i just got to keep moving forward and while he will think back on it in certain situations it doesn't ever come up as an excuse for him or as a uh, as a way to think that he can't get ahead because of it like he's still going to keep going out there <clears throat> and keep trying to do his thing and he's one of those guys you just don't want to mess with I mean, there's a particular scene in the movie where he actually challenged, and once again, in the trailers, so I'm not spoiling anything, where he straight up challenges Bruce Lee, and it's a great sequence, and it is it is a highlight of the film as well, and, um, uh, what's his name, um, Mike Moe, who plays Bruce Lee, fantastic, that is a fantastic performance by, Bruce, by Mike Moe. He embodies Bruce Lee to, to a T, and if they were ever to make a Bruce Lee biopic, he is the go-to guy to play him in any of those films. Um, but yeah, Brad Pitt just puts on this this beautiful performance by Cliff Booth. I wish there would have been... I mean, he's, he's in it a lot. Don't, I, I know I'm saying I wish there was more of him. He's in the movie quite a bit, but there was so much story that they could have developed and unfolded more that we didn't get answers to. And there are some big, there's some big, big situations that is mentioned about Cliff that we think we're going to get an answer to that we just don't, which is kind of a bummer. Um, but it's also kind of a good thing because if we did find the actual truth out about a certain situation, that might have made us look at him differently. And I think the way we feel about Cliff in this movie is, is fantastic. I wouldn't have wanted that to get tarnished any other way. Margot Robbie as Sharon Tate, she does a great job embodying Sharon Tate. She's bubbly, she's full of life, she's one of the probably the nicest people you ever meet in the film. Uh, she's just happy all the time, and she tries to make anyone around her as happy as can be. She's, a, she's just this big ray of, of sunshine in the film, and Margot Robbie plays it off beautifully. The problem with that 
And I, I will say this review is going to be kind of a little bit intertwined. I'm going to do a lot of my good, but there will be some bad mixed in compared to not just the my what does not work. The big problem with Margot Robbie's performance of Sharon Tate is it's not her performance. It's just that Sharon Tate is not as big of a character as we were made out to believe. She's just kind of kind of little bullet points throughout the film to kind of keep us up to date with where we are time-wise. Uh, so Margot Robbie, while she does a fantastic job as Sharon Tate, she's really not given a whole lot to do. She has like really one real big scene uh, in the movie. Um, and even then, she's just kind of sitting there. I mean, like I said, she's playing it very, very well. But if you're going into this movie, that's that's another big thing, too. A lot of people are going into this film and they're thinking, this is a film where, yeah, it's got Leonardo DiCaprio and Brad Pitt in it, but it is focused on the Manson family and the Manson murders, or the Tate murders, and that's not it at all. Um, I'm going to go out, spoiler, spoiler right now on this, Charles Manson is in this movie for maybe 30 seconds to a minute. So if you're expecting this big Charles Manson thing... You're not going to get it. Yes, is the Manson, um, like, group in this film? Yes. Is there a very long scene in the second half of the film with the Manson family? Yes. Is Manson there? No. Yes, does the climax of the film end up being the night of the supposed murders? Well, not supposed, they are the murders. Um... Yes, that is the climax of the film, but Manson himself is only in about 30 seconds to a minute of this movie, so if you're going in thinking this is going to be a Manson film, it's not. This film is mostly dedicated towards Brad Pitt and Leonardo DiCaprio's characters, and of course Sharon Tate in the moments that you need kind of a breather from Pitt and DiCaprio. Uh, there are a ton, and I mean a ton, I mean a ton of cameos and guest spots of all these actors and actresses in this film. Some of them have great shots, like Mike Moe as Bruce Lee. Um, but then there are others that are just like, you're just in this because you want to be in a Tarantino film. Some people just come in with one set of dialogue and then they're gone. Some have five minutes here, some have maybe a minute here. I mean, there's just so many people in this film. Um, one person in particular, Damian Lewis, he plays Steve McQueen. He literally has one sentence in the entire film, and then he's gone, and we never see him again. De Niro, or not De Niro, um, Pacino, he's literally got, like, two scenes in the film, he's gone. Luke Perry, um, rest in peace, he's got one scene, then he's gone. Timothy Oliphant, two scenes, gone. Um, uh, Dakota Fanning, one scene, gone. Bruce Dern, one scene, gone. It's just, there's so many actors in this film, and I think just because they wanted to be in a Tarantino film that they would have taken any any shot in the film and it's just there's so many people and just not enough time to see him especially Kurt Russell that's another one um he's got a few he's got a couple scenes but then he's gone and we never see him again um it's just there's a there, there's just so much to go around and not enough time and this is a two hour and 45 minute film so it's a long movie and does it tend to show its time especially in the second act absolutely but uh, Hollywood is its own character. It looks beautiful. Um, the shots, the music, the the callbacks to the old-fashioned TV shows, the old movies, everything about it. If you lived in that time, you're just going to be relishing in everything that's happening, whether it be the cars, the clothing, the, the cinema, everything around that time is a definite callback. Tarantino does a fantastic job of trying to keep it authentic and in that world. Um... There's one particular moment I personally wasn't necessarily a fan of, uh, where, uh, and it's like I said, in the trailers, uh, Sharon Tate uh, goes to see her film in the theater, and they use the actual fit footage of that movie. So when Margot Robbie, as Sharon Tate, is watching the film, she's actually watching the real Sharon Tate's movie, not Margot Robbie pretending to be Sharon Tate. So it's kind of, for people who aren't fully up to date with who's who, it is kind of weird that you're seeing Margot Robbie watch herself, but it's not Margot Robbie, it's the actual Sharon Tate. So it would be kind of a little bit weird for people watching that film, because it's like, you two don't really look alike. So that's, that's a little bit weird, but it's a beautiful scene for Sharon Tate, uh, played by Margot Robbie in that moment, of just someone who's so in love with the world of Hollywood. And that she's, you know, she's there because she just wants to see 
what does the audience think of her performance? Do they do they like her? Do they not like her? And someone who's like clear, like I know for me when I was when I was a pro wrestler, I would go back and watch my tapes, a to study and b to see if if I'm, you know, if, if the crowd responds to me. And that's basically what she was doing in that moment. She's just so in love with everything that has to do with her life right now. I mean, she's like I said, there's literally nothing that can go wrong with her life up till the supposed end, um, which I'm not gonna say whether or not. Tarantino changes things because we know Tarantino loves to change history, a la Inglorious Bastards. Um, whether or not that does get changed, I am not going to say. Um, but it is definitely a very interesting, interesting and uh, violent uh, finale to this film overall. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I liked about the film. What does not work, and I kind of said it a little bit, is there are way, just way too many actors in this film and not enough time given to a lot of them. Like I said, Margot Robbie's performance of Sharon Tate, while she's great, she's not given as much time as uh, Pitt and DiCaprio in this movie, so Sharon Tate just does not feel like a big part of the film overall, um, as well as other characters in the film. Some pop in and then think like they're going to have a big presence in the film, but then are completely dropped and never seen again. Um, the second act is uh, a very, very slow moving. There's one particular scene in particular in the middle of the film that goes on for way too long. Um, and uh, while, yes, it's, it's, it's not bad, badly performed by any means, there's no bad performances in this movie. It's one of those that's like, all right, come on. Let's 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 get going because this is just going on way too long. Um, so the 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 length of the film definitely does feel it in this movie. I do feel that based off of the certain things that I saw in the film, they probably could have cut about thirty to forty five minutes of film um, and kept it at a, at a tighter two hours or maybe two hours and fifteen minutes instead of going to the two full the two forty five. Um, uh, the uh, the one <laughs> I, I, I decided I, I, I've been debating whether to bring this up or not, but I'm just gonna go ahead and do it. The one thing, and if you guys have never noticed this, surprise! I'm gonna burst your bubble when it comes to Tarantino. Tarantino clearly has a foot fetish. If you guys have not noticed that in any of his films, he's all about showing feet. I'm not a guy who likes feet, and this movie is all about feet. <laughs> there are so many foot shots and just cameras staying on feet. Uh, and all they're either dirty or blah, blah, blah. it's just so many times. There's literally one scene where there are literally is feet right in front of your face the whole time for about a solid minute. And I'm just like, change the camera shot, please. I don't want to look at that. Um, it's almost to the point where it's like I think he thinks it's a joke now because everyone knows that he's like, okay, you guys think I like feet? Well, I'm gonna show you a whole lot of feet. Um, it was just, it was kind of annoying. I like I say, if it's a, if it's a practical joke on him, then good on you, but I, I'm not a fan of it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's not as story driven as like something like a Django Unchained or an Inglorious Bastards. It's, it's a very kind of, there's a lot of separate things going on. Um, kind of like Pulp Fiction-ish, uh, Pulp Fiction-like, but it is still maintained around these three main characters, uh, Pitt, DiCaprio, and, and Margot Robbie. Um, but there's just so much going on around the film that you can kind of either lose yourself or lose track of what's going on. There's also one part of the film, I'm not 100% sure if it was our projector, <coughs> excuse me, or if it was the actual film itself, where there was some weird editing in the movie. Um, and for anyone who watches this review before they see the film... The scene I am talking about, you guys can leave your comments and tell me, no, Sean, it was just your projector, or yeah, this was in the film. Um, it's when Timothy Oliphant, Oliphant uh, first meets Leonardo DiCaprio's character. Uh, it literally is a bad edit job. He goes from taking off his cowboy hat and he's holding the here to then all of a sudden the hat's back on his head. And then there's another little, like, a little jump cut, like, right after that, too. And I don't know if it messes with the dialogue or if it flows, because I was so distracted by that. But there was just, like, little things here or there, which either, A, it was a director's decision that he was kind of tipped in the hat to something that maybe happened in 1969, or it was just a bad edit, which I find hard to believe because it's Quentin Tarantino, and he goes over his movies like a fine-tooth comb. Um, but that really jarred me, because uh, it was just like, okay. And then also, like, an hour and a half into the film, they start narrating the, the, the story, 
which kind of felt out of place. Like, it was one of those things where it's like, have they been narrating this film the entire time and I just haven't been paying attention? Or did they just start dropping a narrator uh, halfway through this film? <clears throat> or over halfway through this film? And the answer is, yeah, they just randomly started dropping a narrator out of nowhere um, because there was a time jump and they apparently needed you to explain to you what happened, but they didn't want the characters to do it. So, like I said... Little decisions here and there that just I wasn't personally a fan of or agreed with, but overall, um, I, I I really really enjoyed the film. I thought it was incredibly well done by Tarantino, and there are certain things that I wasn't necessarily a fan of, like think choices and decisions he decided to do. <coughs> it's not, it's definitely not going to be in his top echelon of films. Um, it is still very good, and it's better than a lot of his worst movies, but when we come down to the end of his journey as a director and we go, what are his best films, this one's going to be kind of in the middle of the pack, and it's definitely not going to be in the top um, echelon of his films, even though DiCaprio and Brad Pitt both give phenomenal performances that we will probably see towards awards season. If not DiCaprio, then definitely Pitt. Uh, but yeah, overall, I highly recommend this movie for people who are fans of Quentin Tarantino or people who are fans of any of these actors, <coughs> excuse me, or anyone who's a fan of that time frame in terms of Hollywood cinema. But be, bear in mind, it is two hours and 45 minutes long, so it, it does tend to show its length about in the second half, but then it does pick up again in the third half, or the third act, I'm sorry. So yeah, I strongly recommend this movie, and because of that, it does end up in the top 10 of the year for me. Um, it does not hit the number one spot, obviously, but it does come in at number 8 on the year. So going to our top 10 of 2019 so far, number one's going to stay with Toy Story 4, number two is going to be Avengers Endgame, three goes to Rocket Man, four goes to Spider-Man Far From Home, five goes to Booksmart, Six goes to us. Seven goes to John Wick, Chapter 3, Parabellum. With eight going to uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Nine going to Midsummer. With ten going to Disney's Lion King. With Longshot dropping out of the top ten. <clears throat> I hope you guys enjoyed this review. And if you guys did, go ahead and hit that like button. If you guys feel like this review is worth sharing, go ahead and hit that share button. But most importantly, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. So that way you guys stay up to date with all the latest videos that pop up on the channel. And also don't forget to follow us on all the social media outlets you see below. Next week, we probably got the most <laughs> the most popcorn summer flick of the summer with Hobbs and Shaw. So be on the lookout for that review come next Friday. And uh, yeah, uh, I hope you guys, um, I, I know I just dropped a lot of reviews today. Uh, it's basically playing catch up. But uh, be on the lookout for all those reviews that dropped. And uh, see you next week for Hobbs and Shaw. And until next time, in case I don't see you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night, movie crusaders.